ship is to sacred fall for a moment the heart to death all and more love one another not hit the Savior Children, obey the Father's blessed command. Love one another, not hate the Savior. Children, obey the blessed command. Let our word be sweetly focused. Show our love to one another with the abundance of kind words. Love one another, not hate the Savior. Children, obey the Father's blessed command. Love one another, not hate the Savior. Children, obey the blessed command. Be seated, please. Good morning. It's great to see you here this morning, and uh, especially if you're visiting with us, you're an honored guest, and we really appreciate you coming and, and worshiping God here at North Highlands this morning. Again, like, as was said earlier, please stick around for a little while afterwards. Let us shake your hand, and thank you for coming to see us this morning. Um, in light of the things that have happened uh, yesterday over in Charlottesville, Virginia, I'd like to, uh, to lead us in a prayer for our, our country and for the things that are happening right now, and uh, a prayer that we would... Uh, help our country recognize the love that God has for every single race and the fact that uh, he created all races from one man and so truly we're one race the human race will you pray with me dear Heavenly Father our hearts break when we see the the racism and we see the the ugliness uh, that so many are, are struggling with in their hearts father we pray God that you would help us to influence and to encourage and to help uh, that others might see each other as, as precious souls, as image bearers of a creator who loves them, Father, and that we might embody your love for one another. And Father, that we would truly uh, not see races or, or different uh, colors of skin, but that instead we would see souls, that we would recognize one another as precious in your sight, and that we would do everything we can to bring dignity and honor. Father, that we would bring love into the hearts of of others. Father, help us to set an example as your people, uh, as, as those who, who don't struggle with racism in our heart, who have put those things away that divide us, but instead choose love and choose to, to honor your command and your expectations of us to love each other, to look out for one another and to lift one another up and never tear one another down. Father, we pray for you to be with those uh, families who are struggling at this time, who are hurt by the things that have happened and we pray father that you would uh, comfort them and and help them and that you would be with the christians who are immediately there in their area that they might minister to them and encourage them and help them uh, through this through this time of struggle and most of all father that you would help to heal the minds of those who uh, could see to do these types of things to one another that you would help them to realize the truth before it's everlastingly too late Father, uh, thank you so much for this great country and with all the faults and the struggles that we do have, Father, we know that we're blessed beyond our imagination and we pray that you would help us uh, to live up to the ideals that this country was founded on, uh, the ideals that come straight from your word, from your mind, and from your heart. We love you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Um, this morning, I wanted to talk about sharing the good life. If you have your smartphone or other device, I encourage you to follow along uh, with the lesson. 
Um, the, the lesson this morning, also I'm going to be using the New Living Translation. And so if you have your, your uh, Bible on your phone, you can switch over to the New Living Translation and maybe uh, uh, keep up a little bit better as we look at some of these passages. I just felt like uh, that translation had some uh, very good wording uh, in the passages that we're going to be looking at this morning. We're mostly going to be in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 4 through 8. You know, as we, uh, as we read the scriptures, as we understand the teaching of Jesus Christ, we have to understand that evangelism is not a suggestion. You see, evangelism, teaching others and, and helping them to understand God's will for their life is not something that God is, is hoping that we will do. It's an, uh, a non-negotiable imperative to living in Christ. We were just reading in Colossians chapter 3 and verse 4 together how that he says, when Christ, who is your life? When Christ, who is your life? He says, your life is Christ. You are to live your life for him. Uh, you are to be uh, as he would have been if he were in your shoes, if he were living your life, to be like Christ. He says, this is who your life is about. You see, the last thing Jesus said to us, to his followers, remember? Go, teach, baptize, and teach some more, right? If we aren't willing to tell others about what Jesus has done for us, what are we doing? How are we actually living out a Christian life if there's nothing Christ-like about our effort to reach more souls for Him? What greater impact could we have on the struggles that we see in our community, in our, in our country, uh, than to be more Christ-like and to help others to see as Christ sees, to de have the same desires that Christ has? You see, if His love uh, is, is evident, if it's not evident in our lives, if it's not something that is, is practical and understandable and seen every day in our lives, then we have absolutely missed the mark. Christ is our lives. And there's so many important things for us to understand about the fact that He is our life. You know, not too long ago, our, our group, we were on our way to, and, and, and of course, came, came back from Guyana from our mission trip. It was a great great trip. Uh, something that we saw and, and something that many of you have seen though in the airport, uh, you'll see the power sidewalk. You know what I'm talking about? It, it's kind of like an escalator, but it's a sidewalk and it's just moving quickly. It doesn't take you up or down. It just takes you straight ahead and it moves very quickly. And of course we had long layovers and so we kind of watched some people on the, on the power sidewalk. And of course uh, Tim's not here this morning so I can tell you Tim was just doing it over and over again, you know, and he was having fun on it. And, uh, but something that I noticed as you're, as you're watching the power sidewalk, you'll see people not using the power sidewalk and they've got their, their suitcase and maybe they've got more than one and they're struggling. And they're trying to walk carrying this stuff and, and it, you just can't help but think, why don't you get on the power sidewalk? It'd be a lot easier for you, you know? And, and in fact, uh, there were people struggling along and, and Tim would be going and he'd make it twice, you know, past them and be able to come back and do it again before they ever made it to the end to get to where they were going. Some of these people are trying to get to the, to the next flight, you know? And, and, and yet they could have had it so much better had they just used the power sidewalk. It, their life would have been easier. Uh, their, their travel experience would have been better, right? It would have, everything would have gone better for them if they just accessed the power sidewalk. And I can't help but feel the same way about the good life in Christ. You know, so many today are, are dragging the, the struggles that they face and, and the struggle with sin and the, the the problems of this life with them. And instead of accessing, instead of tapping into the power that comes from living the good life in Christ, they'll just struggle along. And never realizing how much easier, how much better it would be if they would just tap into His strength, if they would tap into His goodness, if they would live according to His way. I just can't help but see this in our lives today. Let me tell you another one. What about Christians who, who struggle along through life rather than tapping into the power of the people of Christ? Of other believers who are struggling to do what is right, who are striving to be pleasing to God in their life. And yet we have so many who will stand on the outside of the church and yeah, they believe in Jesus. It's not that they don't know the power of the power sidewalk. You know, it's not that they don't understand that it works. You know, it's not that they don't understand that. But 
rather than getting and being a part and being involved and, and taking part in the ministry and, and, and going along on the power, they'll, they'll just kind of struggle on their own. And rather than tap into the strength of the church of Christ, they'll struggle along in their own strength facing the problems of life every day all on their own, never realizing how much easier, how much better it is when you work together with God's people. But when you, when you come together and you share the good life in Christ, church, I think we need to learn this lesson. And we need to recognize that we are to be a part of the church and that we are the church. And until we behave as the church, it's going to be hard. It's going to just be like struggling with those heavy bags, trying to get along and watching these other people just zooming by through life and facing difficulties, sure, but they've got the power behind them. They've got help behind them when they face those times. We've got to learn to share the good life. You see, Jesus, he wants to uh, fill us with his love. He wants to fill us with his courage and his truth so that others can have the precious salvation offered to them that we find only in Jesus. And so my, my encouragement this morning is, is first to realize that until we love each other as the church, until we serve one another in Christ as the church, those who are outside are never going to recognize any difference. Remember, Jesus said, it's by your love that the world will know that you belong to me. It's by your love. He said, I want you to love one another. And so when they see a love, a power source in the church, it will help them to desire to be a part of the church. It will show them the better way. So there's just a few ideas this morning to help us as we struggle in this life to share the good life with others. First, we are to be about sharing a divine message. We should be sharing a divine message. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, starting in verse 4, notice with me, it says, For we speak as messengers approved by God to be entrusted with the good news or the gospel. Our purpose is to please God, not people. He alone examines the motives of our hearts says we have a job to do. We have a responsibility to share the gospel, to share the good news. And being entrusted with this message, it's a huge responsibility. It can't be minimized by neglect and it can't be stopped by our fear. You see, we're all teaching something by our lives and it ought to be the gospel. What is it that you're teaching by your life? Uh, many of us, uh, we are, we, we're going through life and, and the things that people are learning from our lives are lots of different things, but not necessarily the gospel. And this ought to be changed. This ought to be something that we focus on and that we say, you know what, the main thing I want others to take from my life when they notice me or when they see me, when I'm influence, uh, influencing them, when they know about me, I hope and I want and I desire above anything else that they know the gospel, that they know the good news of Jesus Christ. Because this is a message that we have been given a responsibility to share. Notice in 2 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 2, it says, The only letter of recommendation that we need is you yourselves. You, your lives are a letter written in our hearts. Everyone can read it and recognize our good work among you. Clearly, you're a letter from Christ showing the result of our ministry among you. This letter is written not with pen and ink, but with the Spirit of the living God. It's carved not on tablets of stone, but on the human heart. It's another way of saying you might be the only Bible someone ever reads, right? This is you are the letter of Christ. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, right? He says you are the one to live the life of Christ, to live out uh, the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ in the, in the presence of other people. Uh, to help them learn the gospel through your life. You see, our message is the message of what we have experienced. It's not only the message of what we've learned, which is extremely important, but it's also the message of what we have experienced in our own death, burial, and resurrection. In a death, burial, and resurrection that happens over and over again through life as we face situations, struggles, even sins, and we, and we give them to God and we're reborn again over and over to live a Christian life, to live a life that brings glory to His name. It's our experience because we've all struggled. 
We've all felt the despair of grief. We've all been to the floor in pain. But we've also received strength from God to deal with those setbacks. And we've heard from Him in our weakest moments. And we know that His way is best because we've lived it. In Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 15, it says, Ever since I heard of your strong faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for God's people everywhere, I've not stopped thanking God for you. I pray for you constantly, asking God, the glorious Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, to give you spiritual wisdom and insight so that you might grow in your knowledge of God. I pray that your hearts will be flooded with light so that you can understand the confident hope He has given to those He has called His holy people who are His rich and glorious inheritance. <clears throat> you can be His rich and glorious inheritance. That's, that's His description of who you are as the church. But if you struggle along by yourself, if you refuse to tap into the power that's available to you in the church, and you just kind of do your own thing, maybe checking in with the church once a week, right? Uh, maybe checking in twice a month or so, or just seeing how things are going, uh, making sure maybe that, that you, you send a check or, or that you somehow are a part, but you, rather than get involved, keep your distance. Since you're not tapping into the power. You're never going to understand the depth of the riches of the glory of God that He has bestowed on His church. You see, the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ is our message because we've also died, we've been buried, and we've been resurrected. We die to ourselves in repentance. We're buried in a watery grave and risen up out of that watery grave to walk a Christian life. In Colossians 3 and verse 1, it says, Since then you have been raised to new life with Christ, Set your sights on the realities of heaven where Christ sits in the place of honor at God's right hand. Think about the things of heaven, not the things of the earth. For you died to this life and your real life is hidden with Christ in God. And when Christ, who is your life, is revealed to the whole world, you will share in all his glory. Do you see what's happening here? There's a condition. This is the, the expression of the Holy Spirit. He's saying, once you put your mind on the things of heaven rather than the things of the earth, then your life is Christ. But when you keep your focus on eternity, when you keep your focus on what brings glory to His name, He says your life is Christ. But if you don't, if you just focus on the things of this world, if you just focus on the struggles rather than tapping into the power, the help that can help you overcome those struggles, or rather than accessing the power of others who also love the Lord. How can your life be Christ? How can your life look like Christ when you don't behave and you don't think and you don't talk like Christ? You see, we need to take ownership of the divine message the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. We need to live it. We need to speak it. We need to share it. And we must share it if we ever hope that our life is Christ, that we might share in His glory when He returns. So share the divine message. But also, you know, there's sharing that's more than words. There's more than words involved in this sharing. There in 1 Thessalonians 2, verse 5. He says, never once did we try to win you with flattery. As you well know, and God is our witness that we were not pretending to be your friends just to get your money. As for human praise, we've never sought it from you or anyone else. As apostles of Christ, we certainly have the right to take, make some demands of you. But instead, we were like children among you. Or we were like a mother feeding and caring for her own children. Hear what he's saying? He's saying, look, we didn't use big words. We didn't try to convince you with some, some philosophical arguments. You know, we didn't come to you with, with this uh, amazing knowledge only. No, we came to you and you experienced our humility in Christ. You experienced the fact that we humble ourselves before Him. And together we serve Him together based on the knowledge that we have but then putting it into practice in experience because the fact is you know mere words fail mere words fail too often 
You've been in those conversations before where you say something and the person heard something totally different, right? You meant it in one way, but the person took it in a whole other way. I'm a preacher. It happens to me all the time, okay? And, you know, sometimes we send text messages. I don't know if you can see these text messages. They might be kind of small. But, you know, we send these text messages and sometimes we can't even write words correctly, right? And we try to say these things and autocorrect totally destroys our messages that we try to that we try to say. Here's one uh, from the mom, and she says, what does IDK, LY, and TTYL mean? Her, her child responds, I don't know, love you, talk to you later. Mom says, okay, I'll ask your sister. She didn't get it, right? She didn't understand. She was actually getting the answer, but she didn't get the answer, you, you see? And sometimes well, we do the same thing in our life. Our words aren't always going to work. Our words aren't powerful enough to execute uh, the, the point of what is happening. And too often we fall short. You're starting to get some of those. Okay, good. And so sometimes we fall short in our words. But isn't it wonderful that God knows that? That He already knows how frail we are and how, how simple we are and how we mess things up. It's not supposed to be dead husband. It's supposed to be dear husband if you're reading up there. All right, and so... And so Sometimes we struggle with our words, but God didn't just give us words. You know, when you doubt your ability to use the right words or to pitch, quote unquote, the gospel in the right way, we're really missing the point, aren't we? Aren't we missing the point of what God is really expressing to us through the Holy Spirit here? He's saying, listen, you live it every single day. And when you live it every single day, your words will work, even though they're wrong sometimes. Even though I say the wrong things at times, if you know my heart, the actions speak louder than the words. And the knowledge of what you mean comes across in your behavior so much more powerfully than in your words. We need to share more than words. We need to share our lives with one another. <clears throat> you see, God's part is to take what we do and what we say and bring an increase to it. He's the one who will bring an increase. He's the one who will help the church to grow. He's the one whose power we are trying to access, not somehow our own. In 1 Corinthians 2, as Paul is writing to this church that he loved, and he's inspired by the Holy Spirit to, to make some, some confessions, to say something to them about his past. Notice, it says, when I first came to you, dear brothers and sisters, I didn't use lofty words and impressive wisdom to tell you of God's secret plan, for I decided that while I was with you, I would forget everything except Jesus Christ, the one who was crucified. I came to you in weakness, timid and trembling, and my message and my preaching were very plain. Rather than using clever and persuasive speeches, I relied only on the power of the Holy Spirit. I did this so that you would not trust in human wisdom, but in the power of God. What if we resolved to know nothing besides Christ and Him crucified? As we strive to serve others, as we express our love to them in actions and in our meager and imperfect words, if we expressed how we believe and why we walk the way we do, why we live the way we do in each day towards those who we hope to influence, it would have a greater impact on this world. You see, helping them to grow and helping them to understand, that's God's part. Your part is to speak the truth in love, Ephesians 4.15. Speak the truth in love. It's He who convicts. It's God who moves hearts. Evangelism isn't about a properly prepared argument. It's about sharing our lives with other people. That's what evangelism is. And that's why Jesus could say, the whole world will know that you belong to me if you have love for one another. That's why he could say that. What do you, what do you mean? Is this an evangelism plan? Yes, that's exactly what this is. When people see a, a sold out church, sold out for one another, loving one another, serving the needs of one another, lifting one another up, don't you think they're going to want a part of that? They're going to see people who are happier, people who are more loved than they've ever dreamed could be possible. It's the difference between getting on that power sidewalk and walking on your own, isn't it? It's the difference that Christ makes in our life, in the life of a church, to care for one another. Notice what Jesus did in Mark chapter 2 and verse 14. 
Here's Jesus uh, living out exactly what he's teaching us here. In Mark chapter 2, it says, As he walked along, he saw Levi, the son of Alphaeus, sitting at his tax collector's booth. Follow me and be my disciple, Jesus said to him. So Levi, he got up and he followed him. Later, Levi invited Jesus and his disciples to his home as dinner guests. Along with many other tax collectors and, and disreputable sinners. There were many people of this kind among Jesus' followers. But when the teachers of the religious law, who were Pharisees, saw him eating with those tax collectors and other sinners, they asked his disciples, why does he eat with such scum? Why does he eat with these people? Jesus heard it, so he told them, healthy people don't need a doctor, sick people do. I've come to call not those who think they are righteous, but those who know they are sinners. Jesus says, He goes to Levi's house. He says, follow me. And he, and he spends some time with him, obviously, because the next thing that happens is he's invited to dinner, right? And so in between this, this invitation for Levi to follow Jesus and the invitation he, re- he receives from Levi to come to dinner, there had to be some influence there. Something obviously happened. It's not like Jesus said, follow me, and, 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 and Levi jumps up and says, hey, come to my house for dinner. That's not what's happening. There's some time that passes in between these sentences that we don't have recorded. There's something that happens here, an influence, a relationship develops to a point where Levi says, I need to make sure you meet my friends, right? This is what's happening here. He says, now come to my house. And and how's he going to gather all of his friends together in that moment? It didn't happen in a moment. It happened over some amount of time. I don't know how much. But here's Jesus living out the example that he wants us to follow. Sharing a life with other people. Influencing them by how you live. Yes, spending time together. There had to be influence. There had to be teaching. There had to be care given in order to get to that moment where he says, come to my house for dinner with all of my friends. You see, sharing lives, it can be messy and it can be uncomfortable at times. It's a mixing of cultures. It's a mixing of traditions, but it's worth it to Jesus. He wants his people together and he wants us to love one another. And then the church in, in Acts chapter 2, as we, we read about the first church and as, as they were first beginning the church, In verse 44 of Acts 2, it says, All the believers, they met together in one place. They shared everything they had. They sold their property and their possessions. And they shared the money with those in need. They worshiped together at the temple every day. They met in homes for the Lord's Supper. And they shared their meals with great joy and generosity. It's impossible to separate the life of a Christian from the word share from the word generosity, from the word give. You see, this is what Christians did, and this is how they were identified in the first century. In fact, in the first, second, and third centuries of the existence of the church, through those centuries, do you know the main thing that you'll find in the writings of those who were not inspired, the writings of of historians who were documenting what was happening at their time, and when they would reference the Christians, when they would talk about the church, do you know the number one thing you'll find? Not that they believed in 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 a guy who they believed had come back from the dead. That's not the main thing they talk about. The main thing they talk about is not that they uh, you know, break bread and, and, and have the Lord's Supper, you know, that they observe this thing that he talked about. That's not the main thing that those outside of the church reference. The main thing they reference is those people take in orphans. The church was identified because of their service, because they had an outlandish love for other people, people who no one else wanted a part of. People who at that time were just cast away. Just left down at the riverbank and told not to come back. Just leave us alone because you're a burden. You're, it's a pity, but we can't take care of you. We can't help you, but not the church. The church went and scooped those children up. The church found a way to serve those. And that's the number one thing you'll find. In the first three centuries of the life of the church of Christ that others were drawn to because of who they were and how they loved. They loved those who were the most unlovable. They reached out to those who were the most unwanted. They cared for them. They didn't just bring them in and, and say, well, you can, you can come by every now and then. No, they made them a part of their families. 
they adopted these children. They adopted these people. How did the church grow by leaps and bounds? How, how did it make such a difference in the beginning? Because they took people nobody else wanted. And they reached out to them and they showed them love. And not just a love that says, hey, here's a, here's a biscuit every now and then. A love that says, here's our table, now it's yours. Here's our home, now it's yours. Here's our heart, now it's yours. When Christ, who is our life, returns, you'll share in His glory. Why? Because you loved. Because you shared the good life with someone who had no access to it whatsoever. You see, relationships are the vital bonds that build a church, that build a community, that build a world in the love of Christ. And we've got to share more than words to make a difference in our community, in our homes, in our country, especially in this world. Last this morning, we've got to be about sharing His love. Notice there in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 8, we loved you so much that we shared with you not only God's good news, but our own lives too. Pretty simple passage. It says, we shared not only the gospel, but we shared our lives. This this, this doesn't mean that he shared the clean parts of his life, you know, that he he shared the the parts of his life that were dressed up, you know, and and looked good for Sunday or whatever. That's That's not what he's talking about. I shared my life with you. All of it. All of it. Everything about me, everything about who I am in my failures, in my successes, in my shortcomings, and in the things I do right. He said, I shared my life with you. He says, not only did I share the gospel, the teaching, the truth of of who Jesus is, but I also shared my experience in that truth with you. You see, a normal person doesn't affectionately long for an acquaintance. You don't fall in love with a stranger, do you? You fall in love with someone as you've spent time with them, as you've gotten to know them. As Paul says, he had given his life to the Christians at Thessalonica. And this is how God expects his people to behave. Devoted to one another in love. This isn't a suggestion. This isn't somehow uh, something that God says, well, you know, it would be really great if y'all did this. He says, this is imperative. This is the only way. And until you live this way, nothing is going to work right. The church isn't going to seem like a church. It's going to seem like a social club. It's going to be like a social gathering where you come together and you agree on everything and then you go back living however you want. But if you'll come together and meet one another's needs and find out how you can serve one another in the love of Christ, if you share your lives together, then the church has power. Then the church has influence. Then the church has strength. And it's the strength that comes from knowing Jesus Christ. In Romans 12 and verse 10 he tells us love each other as Christian brothers show respect for one another in 1 Peter 1 22, he says you have made your souls pure by obeying the truth through the Holy Spirit this has given you a true love for the Christians let it be a true love from the heart let it be a true love from your heart 1 Thessalonians 4 and verse 9 You don't need anyone to write to you about loving your Christian brothers. God has taught you to love one another. As if that's the end of the, that's just the end of it, right? There's nothing more to say. God taught you to love each other, so do it. This is how you behave. This is just how it works. This is just what happens when you understand what's been done for you in Jesus Christ, in the sacrifice that was made, then automatically we should also be prepared. We should also be prepared willing and even more than willing we should desire greatly to love one another also to show the love of Christ to one another and until we do show that love the world's not going to believe the world's not going to turn their 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 their, uh, their lives over to him they're not going to look at the church and say man I want a piece of that I want to be just like them not until we love In John 13 34 Jesus said I give you a new law You are to love each other. You must love each other as I have loved you. If you love each other, all men will know you are my followers. I want to encourage you this morning to tap into the power of his love. To be a part of the power sidewalk that is the church of Christ. 
The church that truly is of Christ. Uh, not a church in name only, but a church that actually does what Christ says and who loves each other. Uh, loves each other so much that people who aren't affiliated with that church look at that church from the outside and say, wow, they love each other. Look at how they care for one another. Look at how they take care of others. Look at what they're doing. There is surely a God in the hearts of those people. Let's spend time cultivating relationships like we did yesterday on a creek. Let's spend time cultivating relationships in the church in order to deliver His love into the hearts of one another. And until we learn to give that love to one another, we're never going to have the opportunity to give it to those who are outside. The fact is, if we haven't been giving the love that we should to the church, we need to repent. And we need to start to give love like we've never imagined. And we need to stick up for one another and look out for one another and hope for one another, pray for one another to share the good life of Jesus Christ with one another. My encouragement to you today is if you're not a Christian, come be a part of what's happening. Get in on the power that's only found in Jesus Christ by responding to His grace in obedient faith, a faith that that humbles yourself before God and submits to a repentance that is like death. A repentance that says, I never want to live in sin again. And I'm dying to that old way of life. A, a humbleness that says, I'll be immersed for the forgiveness of my sins because that's what you taught. Because Jesus was buried, I want to be buried too. And then rise up out of that watery grave, a Christian. A new life. One whose Christ lives in your heart. And if you are a Christian, but you know you haven't been on the power sidewalk. If you haven't been involved in the church, if you haven't made uh, an effort to let the church make a difference in your life, change. Repent. Confess those things to God right where you're sitting or come forward and let everyone know so we can pray with you and for you. Whatever your need is, come while we stand and we sing.